what you see is that if you're not academically gifted, then they actually try to push you out of those schools. So that's the side of the thing no one talks about, is that well, they, if you're not doing well, they'll just tell you to leave. This is John Firon. He is South African, living in Singapore for 13 years. John is a founder of Invictus and Nicebridge House International Schools in Singapore. We talked about the striking differences between local and international schools here, why Singaporean parents don't want the education system to modernize, and when Singapore and Johor Bahru will finally unite. Special thanks to the educational platform Abrad Institute for supporting this video. More about it later. I'm Max Chernoff. Let's go. How's your life in Singapore? in general, like compared to other places that you used to live? I hate to admit it, but I don't know where my key for my house is and I haven't had a key for my house for a very long time. If I do have a key, I just don't have, ever have it with me. That part I really enjoy. I really enjoy the no, no, no crime, no worrying about drugs, no worrying about, you know, my future, really. Singapore is pretty consistent. Like I'm not worried about geopolitical problems. No? Yeah. Don't no. say? No, no, I don't worry about Singapore joining in a war. Yeah, Singapore is just basically is the little Switzerland of Asia. What do you think the future of Singapore, let's say in 10 years or in 20 years, what will be Singapore looks like? It's a tough question because Singapore changes very rapidly. If you think about it, like when we, when I first arrived 13 years ago, the whole of the marina center was not built. All those high rises were not built. We're watching gentrification happen all the time. You, you see. You know, we're living, we're, we're in Tanglin right now. I have two on blocks that just went, went off in the last little while. And uh, the businesses are shutting down, the buildings will be torn down, yeah. the buildings will be rebuilt. What you see is that constant change. You see a constant improvement infrastructure. When I first arrived, there were two or three <coughs> MRTs, and now I think there's six or seven. I've lost track. You know, you can get anywhere on the island yeah. uh, from here. I remember when Holland Village opened up, it was a huge deal. Mm. Over 20 years, I think they're gonna keep building the same. They're gonna run out of places to tunnel. What would change? I think that the in 20 years, I think that the relationship between Johor Bahru and Singapore will change. Yeah, in a... This will change. Direction. This is the biggest change. Yeah. that I see. I think that, the, uh, the, the, that at some point it will open up. I think that basically Johor, Bahru and Singapore will become, will act a lot more like one. It makes sense. And makes that sense. will change everything. It'll change the labor markets. It'll change everything. Because remember there are only 5 million people here and they have a problem with getting more people. But yeah. if Johor, Bahru really truly opens up, then you'll see an influx of people in Johor, Bahru, which will make Singapore closer to Hong Kong in terms of a labor market. Do you think like in 10 or 20 years, think Singapore will have some kind of bubble with air conditioning outside to protect <laughs> the Singapore from the heat? I don't think it needs to. I mean, I know that Lee Kuan Yew said that the greatest invention ever was air conditioning for Singapore. I think already it's air conditioned bubble already. If you think about like you can stand, uh, the, like let's go down Orchard Road. You can go inside Orchard, you can walk down Orchard Road without ever walking on Orchard Road. Yeah, yeah, through the malls. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. all one long corridor of air-conditioned bliss. Yeah. We're shopping heaven, right? So that's all air-conditioned. Do you think, no, I don't think it would be the whole island. Uh, I think it would be similar to what it is now and just but more of it. I mean, you can just see modernization of shopping malls, uh, the expansion of shopping malls is going to be bigger and bigger. Incredible project in Singapore is that they're moving the whole port area from the CBD, from city center, all the way to us is so yeah. impressive. And they're gonna build affordable housing there, yeah. which is even more impressive. If you think about it, like most international places would say, okay, we have a water line. We're gonna build really expensive houses on the water line and maximize the dollars. I, I'm not saying that they won't build any of that, but majority, I think a big part, portion of that space is gonna be dedicated to HDB flats which is quite amazing. It's not just you know, making money, it's also looking after yeah. local population. How you get into the educational business? The education business was through my, through my own needs. My children needed to go to school. The yeah. schools are really expensive in Singapore. I have three kids and uh, I realized that at the time there were no affordable schools. So we, we built, we started with Invictus, built Invictus, sold Invictus, and then bought a nice rich house. <laughs> my next one yeah. yeah but i built along the way i built a few schools in uh, with invictus we built schools in singapore hong kong cambodia and then now it's spread into thailand malaysia a few other countries china today education is easily available even on the device that you are using to watch this video all you need is upgrad institute who is also the supporter of today's video upgrad institute is a part of upgrad asia's largest integrated learning and career development company that has made an impact to over 10 million total registers 
Upgrade Learners across more than 100 countries today. In Singapore, Upgrad now has an Upgrad Institute, a premier private education institution that holds a four-year HU Trust certification by CPE. If you want to get promoted to start your own venture, Upgrad Institute has you covered, as you can now enroll in the most affordable MBA in Singapore by Deakin University, a top 1% global university, and world's top 20 online MBA programs. It is time for you to stop dreaming and start learning the skills needed to achieve your goals. In this program, you will receive cutting-edge content and earn alumni status by Deakin Business School, as well as learn industry-relevant content from faculty and industry leaders. This program is also WES recognized, which means that if you're applying for a visa or immigration process, the program certification can be used for that application. So follow the link in the description and take the next step towards career success. For now, back to the video. What do you say, like how different is, let's say, typical international school and local school in Singapore? Like what's the principal differences? The principal difference is that you can't typically get into a local school. As, so a, you, as a foreigner. As a foreigner, yeah. yeah. So if you do, you have to, there are a couple of ways to do it, but basically it's um, not really uh, something that the local government wants, the Singapore government wants. They want it to be for locals. Um, so they're making it harder and harder and harder. Yeah. And now what they've done is they said, if you do get into a local school and you are an employment pass holder, you're paying close to $10,000 a year anyway to go to school. I know it sounds like very cheap compared to the Canadian, but like in Knightsbridge House is only $12,000. So yeah. we're not far away from that from that price point. Foreigners go to international schools, locals go to local schools. Yeah. Why is that? The reason is because Singapore children are not allowed to go to international school. But why? 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 Why is this rule in the first place? The idea is it's a it's a socialist idea, is that we should all as a Singaporean uh, you should go to the same you should have the same opportunities. So if you think about it, like in Western countries uh, or other countries, you may have ability for your local students to go to a more prestigious school. They get better teachers, they get better curriculum, they get more, they get more, basically more money pushed up to them education level, yeah. which gives them an unfair advantage yes. in life. Yeah. So the Singapore way is to say, well, we all get the same education level. The reality is that a lot of the, the Singaporeans when school finishes, go to tuition centers. And then you see the tuition center market is a huge market in Singapore. And people are doing a lot of extra preparation through the tuition centers, which is one of the reasons I think that you see the Singapore examinations, um, they're marking the marks that they get in international courses are so good is because they've spent so much money on tuition, which is closer to one-on-one -on -one or, you know, I've seen like mass tuition where it'll be one teacher to one student, which is pretty like intense and that, that'll yeah. be expensive, yeah, on an hourly basis. Even international school students do that. The Singapore way is great, but when you really look at the outcomes, the, yeah. the way that the, the Singaporeans get around it is they basically spend the money on tuition centers. And another one is like, I know the, the best schools are in Bukit Timah, let's say, local schools. And to live in Bukit Timah, you also kind of need money. Uh, yeah, so you have a one kilometer radius rule as well. Yeah. So what happens is that Singaporeans will buy property around the best schools, so they get into the best local primary schools, which then will give them a better chance to go to the high school that's a Attached to it, which is the which is the other way that they try to, you know. But Singapore's intention is good. The yeah. intention for everyone having an equal uh, education system is a good idea. Yeah. It's just that people, by nature, will will try to give, give their children a leg up. The reputation for local schools is like, oh, they are strict there, and kids are like more oriented to like math and to like uh, science in general and less to being creative and stuff. Is it like true or it's partially true? Like if you compare again, like local education system and international schools. If you think about it like this, international school will have maybe 25 kids in a class is a typical kind of rule. You yeah. find them in international schools where the local school will have anywhere between 35, 40 students in a class. So from just a management, a classroom management perspective, the Singaporean schools will need to be a bit more strict to manage 40 kids in a class versus 25 kids in a class. It's, yeah. it's just the nature of our numbers. And then if you look at it from a perspective of Singaporean teachers stricter than international teachers, yeah, of course, they, they, they've been taught to manage larger classes, so they have to be a little stricter. In terms of the math side, yeah, I said Singapore math is one of the best maths in the world yeah. from a curriculum perspective. So, and if you follow that and you're determined and you study hard, you're going to get good maths. Typically, I would say if you look at Singapore maths, it's probably a grade ahead of where a normal uh, education system would be. Someone told me that every 10 years, I think, 
Singapore has this big thing that they kind of see the best practices all over the world and then they kind of tweak their approach to education. Yeah, so that's in the local school system. Basically, they're looking at improving the local school system. So if you, even if you look at it, one of the things they've changed is they've said that they are going to be less um, focused on testing and they're going to make it more holistic and you know they're going to try to move away from testing continuously. The reality is that the parents don't want that. Oh. Yeah, because parents want like the best IB score. And then <laughs> they want the local parents want the testing because they want the, the marks. They want to prove that their child is doing well academically and they spend a lot of money on tuition. So that gives them that that feeling of well-being yeah. that they've done something right. So it's a, there's a pull and pull push between the government wanting to become more holistic and the local parents saying, no, 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 we really want more of that hardcore oh. academic. I'm more like on a relaxed side. I don't care as much about the, the marks. Sure. Because I'm maybe more entrepreneurial because yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But I know like some of my friends, they're the foreigners, and they're like, no, I go, I send my kids to Tangli Trust because it's like 99% score uh, yep. before the uni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. they're really interested in the, in the academic marks because they want to go to the best universities and they want the best outcomes. And fair enough. Yeah, that's a good, that's a fair, fair approach. Uh, but the point is that the probability that your child is going to go to, you know, the best, best, best and do very well is low, right? Because most people are not academically gifted. What you see is that if you're not academically gifted, then they actually try to push you out of those schools. So that's the side of the thing no one talks about is that well, they, if you're not doing well, they'll just tell you to leave. Yeah, they'll tell you to leave for the last year or whatever. And then you just have to find a new school. So you yeah. like, I've heard stories where, where parents have sent their kids for 12 years to the same school. And then the last year we're told, you're not going to continue. What is your personal approach about education, like for your kids? For me personally, I, I want two things. I'd like my children to learn to learn because what I've realized in life is that things are changing constantly. Um, the idea that you're going to get a job and you're going to keep that job for the rest of your life is probably unrealistic given where technology and the pace of technology is. You're going to have to learn to change yourself and you're going to have to be adaptive. Personally, I want my children to do that. I also accept that there are some standards and some norms that, that my children will have to get through. So standardized testing is going to be a thing. It's going to be a thing for the next five to 10 years. So they're going to have to do standardized tests and they're going to have to do well to go to universities. So you want to do a hybrid of both, in my opinion. You want to have your children be able to do well at standardized tests and you want your children to be able to learn, to learn. And that's a combination of two different things because doing well at standardized tests is a function of doing Stunning, swatting, tuition, that kind of thing. Learning to learn is a function of not having that environment where you don't have a teacher telling you exactly what to do all the time. You have to figure it out yourself. So these are very, comp these are, are kind of opposed to each other. And the way to get around this is to have time where they are going to try to figure things out on their own. And then you're going to be time where you're going to maybe support them a little bit more. And uh, that's my approach to parent to, to, to teaching. What was the most challenging to start this educational business in Singapore? You need to have um, quite a lot of belief that you're going to get the license because you have to yeah. set up the school from scratch. Uh, yeah. You've got to do everything. So you've got to do all the renovation. You've got to hire all the people. You've got to do all the work. And then only then will they give you the license. So that's all like a, think about it. It's a, about a year long process before you get to make any money but you've got to spend all the money before that. Definitely. You've got to be committed to a lease. Yeah. yeah. How much you, you have you, you had to spend? Most uh, schools are like a hundred million dollar kind of investments. Hundred million dollar? Wow. Most, most of the big guys, yeah, are like hundred million. Go build a huge building, school, yeah. everything. Yeah, so we do it affordable schools. So our yeah. investments are a lot smaller. The main cost is what? The, the building? You got to renovate. You got to pay all the costs. You got to have working capital. Yeah. Um, while you're building. So day one, you're, you're, you've got no students, then you've got to build students, you've got to get to profitability. Uh, that's a long, can be anywhere between two to five years to, to get to profitability for most schools. Your Invictus, one of them is in Santosa. Used to be, and actually we used Knightsbridge House, took that over, and after a year, the landlord came to us and we couldn't, uh, we could not find a, a, a feasible way forward with the landlord. And that's part of Singapore. That's part of uh, what you will experience in Singapore as a, <laughs> yeah as a tenant <laughs> as a tenant yeah even yeah. on a like big scale business yeah. it's hard the there's a limited amount of space in singapore and the market is uh tight and the landlords are always trying to maximize the yield yeah how is it now there's the spike because of this huge, as you know is a huge spike for like renting uh, like houses is it the same in commercial industry commercial properties yeah so it it's quite interesting i think from uh i think 
we're, mm. we're probably, as uh, I'll, I'll say what Singapore government says, we should go into a recession, you know, later this year, maybe next year. Um, but I don't think that the landlords are interested in that. Uh, that, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're really betting on that's happening. I think they're like, oh, it'll always go up. <laughs> After 13 years of living in Singapore, what you tend to see is that there is a limited number of amount of space. Landlords have a lot of holding power. But if you're a good, if you're a good tenant, the landlords can tend to keep you. Um, just you know, make sure you pay. If you don't pay, they will quickly get rid of you. And, but if you do pay on time and you don't give them any trouble, they tend to like you and then they tend to renew. But if you if you're uh, if you're looking to you know be funny, then they tend to not be. This is a seller's market. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> make sure you pay on time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good advice. <laughs> pay on time and subscribe to the channel. While I'm here, go to the Upgrad Institute website and set yourself up for the career success. Meanwhile, watch the first interview with John where he shares his painful journey to success, his main investment principles and his rules for finding happiness both when broke and as a multimillionaire.